Welcome to this year's OYA Sailability Conference, the first ever to go virtual, with more of you attending than ever from a greater number of organisations, and more than half of you attending for the first time with a good number of international visitors as well. So we're really excited about today. I think we've got a great opportunity to spread the word about voting for disabled people and what it has to offer. So please do use social media to tell your networks about this event, tell your friends, get them to follow us. And, and tell them all about sailability in general. We've got a really exciting program for you today and in the next couple of weeks as well. And we're going to cover topics from restarting to safety, from complex communication to running engaging sessions on the water. Of course, I'm really grateful to Gallagher for sponsoring the event and all they do in partnership with the RYA, in a partnership with the RYA that goes back about 40 years. And they're trying to make sure that insurance products fit what we do as sailing organisations. So thank you to them. Um, for me, 2021 is going to be the year when we regroup, uh, we restart, I hope, and we rebuild. The last 12 months have shown the importance of sport and activity for our physical and mental health like no other. Of, of course, there is so much uncertainty still, and it's not as simple as the government easing the lockdown and everyone announcing a restart date. But I do believe restarting and recovering the sport has to be our focus. I take confidence from the evidence that most of the transition of the transmission of the virus happens inside. And I take confidence from the measures many of you put in place last year to make voting as safe as can be from a COVID perspective. But the last 12 months have been dominated by the pandemic. And while we've all been in the same storm, we've also been in very different boats. Workers on the front line of the NHS, people living in parts of the country with the highest transmission, ethnically diverse communities, people who've kept their jobs, those that haven't, parents homeschooling, teenagers anxious about all they're missing out on, those with good enough IT at home, those without, those able to get outside and stay active and those who can't. So understanding each other's experience and the new barriers people may face is critical. The Activity Alliance published some research in the last couple of weeks highlighting that disabled people's lives have been the hardest hit by the pandemic. With two thirds of deaths from coronavirus, the public health crisis is most, faith, most sharply felt by disabled people. There are widening inequalities and the pandemic has created some new ones too. People have not had the opportunity to be as active as they want, often making physical and mental health harder to manage. A fear of the virus, the impact on health, the lack of support to be active are now significant barriers for disabled people. Which is why one of the only reasonable excuses to leave your home in the current lockdown is for all outdoor organised sport for disabled people. To not do it would have had a disproportionate effect. Benefits of being active, particularly outside, are perhaps more appreciated than ever, and yet it's harder to make it happen. So with this in mind, it was really encouraging to see all the efforts to get back on the water in 2020, however limited, and all of the efforts to stay engaged with sailors and volunteers supporting where you can to look out for each other, to offering all the support, even when you haven't been able to go sailing. A real heartfelt thank you to everyone for everything that you've done. Now, as you signed up for this conference, we asked you what you wanted to get out of it. And, and it does seem like your focus is on finding out about each other's experience of the year. So that kind of regrouping thing, finding out about how to deliver safe activity again in a world shaped by the pandemic. So people are looking to restarting whenever that may be. And you also want to share thoughts and ideas and guidance on encouraging sailors and volunteers back on the water. So we do recognise there is a big rebuilding effort to be done. Of course, there are many challenges and concerns ahead. Optimism about the vaccine is one thing, but concerns about the virus remain, new variants and all. Will enough volunteers and sailors want to get back on the water? How can we rebuild confidence and competence levels following a year largely away from the water. Decision makers constantly having to review current levels of restriction and decide what is possible and how. Finding the right tone and information to persuade people to come back to sailing and volunteering again. And of course, securing funding and keeping organizations going long-term. But despite all these concerns, you share a hope, a determination to get together with friends and get back on the water again. Now, my crystal ball has been rubbish this year, so I hesitate to second guess what the government are going to announce in the next week or so. But there is every chance that outdoor activity is going to be one of the first areas to come out of lockdown. And as I've said, of course, organised outdoor activity and sport for disabled people is already allowed today. 
But in order to restart, we have to learn the lessons of the pandemic. We can't rebuild activity without addressing the impact of COVID-19. And it's harder than ever to deliver activity safely. People are worried. So listening to disabled people about the importance of being active again, about how to overcome new barriers that they face, and to the advice and guidance they're looking for is going to be really, really important. The disability community will need to be as calm and reassuring as ever, full of realistic and practical ideas, and checking in that sailors and volunteers are happy with the plans that you put in place. And you can, and so that they can make a choice about when and how they get involved again. Now, not everybody has had the same opportunity to get back on the water. And more people have gone sailing where families and carers know what they're doing and can offer support, where the sailors themselves have the skills and opportunity to be independent on the water, where the sailability activity or group's got a strong collaborative relationship with a genuinely inclusive sailing club, and where sailors through their membership have had full access to facilities. So sailing clubs and centres have been under a lot of pressure this year. Decision making has been more complex. The full economic impact of the pandemic has yet to play out and funding and income are all an increasing concern. Participants want reassurance that activity is safe and we will do more to enable clubs and centres to strengthen safety management systems. People, particularly volunteers, are key. We can do more to share knowledge and learning so the experience on offer on and off the water is one participants want to come back to again and again. Schools, health professionals, community organisations for disabled people and other partners can really help us reach disabled people, but they've been under immense pressure with new barriers to delivering the support they want to offer. Partners are beginning to re-engage, but they will need convincing there's still a benefit to boating and reassurance that sailability can deliver in the current climate. We've got some great local partnerships out there, but we can do more to know and understand the world our partners are operating in, to map the links that exist and increase the opportunities to get on the water. So today's conference is about sharing two perspectives. It's about the world that schools and community and health organisations are working in and the barriers and challenges they face. But it's also about sailors and their hopes and fears for the year ahead. And if, I'm convinced that if we put both of these at the centre of our planning and thinking, then we have every chance of breaking down some of the barriers disabled people face to get active again on the water and in a boat at some point this year. But first, our keynote speaker. To introduce Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson, I'd like to invite Rick Cassell to join me. I'm really grateful to Rick for asking Tanny if she would talk at the conference this year. Um, many of you will know Rick from his days sailing at Rutland, but Rick is also an elite wheelchair athlete and his friendship with Tanny goes back many, many years with a fair few stories to tell as a result. Um, all I'll say is that I'm delighted that both Rick and Tanny could join us today. My one promise is that apparently Tanny has a fear of water, so please ask her as many questions as you like through the comments, but please don't ask her for a sale. She may never forgive any of us if you do. I, I hope there's gonna be a bit of a time at the end for Tanny's talk for questions, so do put them in the comments on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, but for the moment, Rick, you've just joined us on the screen, so over to you to introduce Tanny. Good morning, everybody. Um, introducing Tanny, that's an interesting one. I've known her for a, a few years, shall we say. I think we go back to the 80s. We both fell in love with a sport that uh, she was destined to become good at, and I was destined to be forever rubbish at. But, you know, that's a different story, really. Um, I think most people know Tanny from her work um, at, at a high level with influencing disability policy and things like that. But to me, she's always been a bit of a nerd and, you know, somebody who is actually a really good friend. She's the godmother to my three children. So that shows you how close we are. And we used to go on holiday together. We used to call it warm weather training. But really, it was just an excuse to get out of this country and go to Florida for a few weeks every autumn, uh, every spring, I mean. Um, Joff has just touched upon the fact that uh, Tony has a... Um, it's not a fear of water, it's just a hatred of the uh, the sickness that it induces in her. Um, she really is hopeless when it comes to, you know, she could be sick floating in a bathtub, I think. So, uh, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Tanny. 
Thank you, Rick. Um, that was really lovely. Um, we've known each other, as you said, since the 80s, so I was always a little bit worried about the introduction might be, but it's really kind. I thought um, I was so very kind, yes. You were, you were very kind to me, so thank you. you. You know so much about my life, so uh, that's lovely. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about sport, a bit about politics um, and, and different things. And um, uh, it's, it's a really tough time for disabled people at the moment. Um, I was really delighted to, to listen to Joff and talk about inclusion um, and how disabled people can have a voice in sport because the reality is it's always been quite difficult and not every governing body is in the same place in terms of genuinely understanding uh, diversity inclusion and, and wanting people uh, to be involved. Um, and some of the challenges that we see um, in terms of governing bodies is, is, is going to be hard to, to kind of fight. So lottery funding and support for elite level has been great, but it hasn't necessarily changed the pathway and the ability for disabled people just to have fun. And I said in, in front of a select committee quite a few years ago, we need to give disabled people the opportunity just to be not very good at sport, but to have fun and take time to develop. And um, as much as I'm passionate about the Paralympics and the pathway, we, we need to make sure that we have that broad base um, at the level. And we have ups and downs in that. Um, and one of the things that I hope comes out of the pandemic um, is, is a rethink of physical activity and sport. But, but actually my frustration with 2012, it was an amazing moment in time. But I'm kind of slightly tired of non-disabled people telling me that 2012 changed the world for disabled people. Since 2012, uh, however amazing it was, as a moment in sporting, sporting moment in time, um, hate crime against disabled children has doubled and hate crime against disabled people is on the rise. And the Crown Prosecution Service say that it's very difficult for police forces to identify it. And even when it goes to court, the additional tariff that can be applied is rarely done so. So um, we don't expect sport to change the world for every, we, we expect it to have an influence. But if somebody stood up and said sport changed, uh, 2012 changed the world for women, then um, they, they would be slightly ignored. But there is something very strange at the moment that people are able to say that about disabled people. And the reality is the stuff that I work on is really hard. You know, um, people either like me or hate me for the stuff I do. I get treated three ways. Once as an ex-athlete, which is generally quite nice. Once as a parliamentarian, people either like you or hate you. And then the third way is a disabled woman where I experience my sort of highest level of, of discrimination. But I work on things like welfare reform, benefits and support and legal aid. Uh, we're working on domestic abuse at the moment and domestic abuse for disabled people uh, and trying to get disabled people more uh, explicitly included in the legislation. But the challenge um, for disabled people, I, I think in many ways it's got harder in the last eight to ten years rather than better. And um, while we sort of slightly bury our heads in the sand about 2012, um, we... we going to struggle to, to change the view because sport massively important still one of the most important things in my life but we have to be quite realistic about the challenges the employment gap for disabled people is twice the national average many companies don't measure disability pay gap because there's not enough disabled people to measure and the pandemic has kind of added to the complexity of those things um people in disabilities between 18 and 34 or 30 times um more likely to die of COVID, as Joff said, 60% of disabled people. Because I genuinely believe um, physical activity is, is part of our recovery for everybody. In the middle of a global health pandemic, we have to think about how disabled people and how people can be active. The Activity Alliance data isn't, again, really a surprise. It's, it's really difficult at the moment. Uh, the dispensation that was given for disabled people to exercise, really good. But there are such difficult decisions to take in terms of health and safety and protecting people. Um, I've, I've had some contact this week from different groups who desperately want to get back on the water. Um, and trustees are saying no. Uh, I'm really happy to have that conversation beyond, beyond here. Um, but trustees are in a difficult position in terms of protecting people. Um, what I would say is 
what what you want is trustees protecting people because it's the right thing to do rather than being from a paternalistic and a slightly ableist view the disabled people can't make decisions for themselves about what they do but that's the subject of a whole another discussion i could spend the next uh, two hours talking about that but i think what what we have to be thinking is actually disabled people being more demanding about their right to be physically active and their right to get into provision uh, and their, their right to be able to do it and their right to be good or not good or just have fun and just sell when the weather's nice or sell when the weather's not nice but but we've got to get over this sort of ableism and paternalistic view that that exists with, within society but ultimately I'm actually for all the really difficult stuff that I've just talked about I am optimistic because what I've seen is disabled people becoming more vocal and um, talking about this in, in you know, a, a, a bigger and a, a stronger way. And actually, you know, we are stronger together. Um, we, we, we can do a huge amount of things, but actually uh, I think we can learn a lot from the campaign in, in the 70s and 80s in terms of the voice of disabled people. And I think we, we have to learn from that and, and we have to get back to some of those days to actually demand our right to be included in society in a really positive way. Um, I'm going to stop talking there because if there were medals for talking, I would win. And Rick has experience of how much I can talk. So um, thank you very much for um, listening today. My email address, if anyone would like to get in touch with me directly, is greythompsont at parliament.uk. We don't have any office staff in, in the Lord, so it's just me answering. But if anyone's got any questions they want to raise directly with me, please get in touch. I'd be like, delighted to, to continue the conversation. Thank you. Can't hear Josh. I mean, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you for all your insight. Thank you for your challenges. Um, and thank you for all your efforts over the years as well. Um, but that was absolutely brilliant. Um, we have got a, a few minutes for some questions. Um, and I've got a couple that people posed us um, towards uh, as they were registering for the conference, really. Um, and, and I guess it's around that, um, you know, that, 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 that challenge we're all facing at the moment that, yes, organised sport for disabled people is possible. So, yes, we could all go sailing today or tomorrow if the weather was a bit warmer. Um, if we wanted to, but but actually there are some real challenges into making that happen. Um, and uh, you, I mean, you touched on the organisational perspective there and that duty of care that trustees have got to, to everybody involved, to, to the participants and all of their volunteers. Um, uh, and, and that disabled people's voice saying, actually, I'd really like to go sailing. And to be honest, I think it's safer than going to the supermarket at the moment. And, and how do we how do we balance those two things? <laughs> It's really difficult because uh, on the one hand, I would be fighting tooth and nail for disabled people to have the opportunity to, to be active and, and you would, but, but actually everybody has to agree in terms of, of the, the health and safety. And, you know, I sit, I'm a trustee on a number of different things and we're making really tough decisions because ultimately who's responsible if something happens, you know, it's, we, you know, safeguarding health and safety, other things, uh, like that it it's really hard but i think we we have to do more in terms of listening to disabled people i think there's things we can do in terms of bubbling and you know whoever realized that was going to be a word that we talk so much about um and i think we have to allow people to take uh, an amount of personal uh, responsibility and personal decision making in terms of what they do um the difficulty you know with with the sport that that's you know is reliant on on volunteers uh, in terms of if, if people need help and support, it's it's joining those things. I think actually it's about having just really sensible grown up conversations um, and, and staying away from the paternalist attitude that disabled people and others can't make decisions. But I, there's no easy answers in this. And, you know, my as a crossbencher, my job is always to be against the government. Whichever government is in power, my job is to to, to, to challenge them and, and disagree with them. But, but no one's had any experience. There's paper exercises of running a pandemic are nothing like they are in the real world and we do have lessons to, there are lots of lessons lots of lessons to learn but but at what point is and having the capacity to learn the lessons is, is going to be really difficult absolutely and and i guess the other side of that question and that that equation then is you know you're someone who loves to be active um and we had emily from banbury in club ask us what can clubs and volunteers do to help people feel safe coming back to boating? So what, what's going to make you feel safe 
getting back to being active again and, and well for me for me a lot of my activity is based on going to the gym so after first lockdown uh it was amazing in terms of how the sector stepped up in terms of separating equipment and cleaning and um distancing um and it it was just fab to be back in in the gym and you know talking to um you know a lot of the older women who swim there you know what a massive impact it it made for them you know it's it's the mental health and well-being it's just being able to see other people it's all those different things and i think for me it's um about just making sure that the other people uh the bit i do worry about about going out day-to-day -day life and i'm not shielding i don't have any underlying health conditions it's people not being daft and coming near me that's the bit i worry about which is really difficult to kind of explain that you know people don't suddenly start thinking they can help me when i don't actually want it or people, you know, um, they don't, people just don't often see wheelchair users. The number of times pre pandemic where people would walk into me or lean over me in a supermarket, it's those are the sorts of things that I worry about. Um, so, you know, when people are close to me, I just cough, actually. I mean, it's really bad. I mean, it's, I've got quite a dark sense of humor. Or um, the last time I went out and someone came very, very close to me, I just said, oh, I don't think my taste has come back yet. And I know I shouldn't joke about it, but sometimes, like, the daily resilience you need. I, I'm, I struggle to find ways to deal with I always use humour anyway. You know, when I used to get people saying, people like you can't do that. It all comes with a pointy finger. You can't do that. I go, well, well, Welsh people. What do you mean disabled? Oh, well, so th that's my own personal coping strategy because otherwise I'd scream at people and swear, mm. which is not really constructive. So I think, um, yeah, it, it is difficult for people to make decisions. I know a lot of disabled people who aren't shielding who are really worried about going back out um be, because of not because of, because of everybody else um and i think one thing we have to just think about in terms of people who can wear masks or, or not just there's there's quite a bit of nastiness around at the moment about wearing masks or, not. or people you say no i can't wear a mask and like can you really you know just people who that the sort of the the anti-vaxxers and the you know the people who think that covid's not a real thing um you know we, we we need to do quite a lot on on, on education in, in terms of that so it's, it's coming out of this is not going to be easy it's 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 going to be a couple of years it's not going to be this summer i i don't believe that i think think will it will change but but it's not going to be quick absolutely and and you know uh, yeah i i take three things from that some some grown-up conversations <laughs> be nice to each other and and don't be you know don't be idiots and you know that it, you know if we if we remember those three simple rules we'll uh we'll 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 make a path through this one way or another um tani and rick uh thank you so much that's been absolutely brilliant um we are going to take a short break now and so we're going to see everyone again at 10 30 for the first of our two discussion panels which are going to pick up on all of these themes um so i'm really excited about the first one I do, you know, I genuinely believe if we're going to restart and rebuild activity this year, we have to understand the world that our partners are operating in um, and the challenges they face and the barriers they face and, and, and the risk assessments they're having to write and all those things. So we're going to be joined by a number of organisations to listen to um, the world that they're operating in at the moment and some of their ideas for overcoming those barriers. So uh, go and make, put the kettle on. Um, and we will see you again at 10.30. Rick, Tani, thank you very much. That was absolutely brilliant. Welcome back. I hope you've uh, refilled your cups and we're ready to go again. Um, as I said before the break, it's really vitally important that we understand the challenges that local schools, community organisations of disabled people and health organisations and all the challenges they're facing, because they're going to be key to really understanding, reaching and reassuring disabled people that voting is a great experience and something we can offer again. So don't forget, if you've got questions for the panel that's just about to happen, please put them in the comments on Facebook and the YouTube stream and get them in there early because then we've got more chance of getting them to the panel. But I'm absolutely delighted that Frank Fletcher has agreed to chair this panel discussion. Frank is the chief executive of the Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust um, and he lives and breathes partnerships. Um, so just this week, he signed a, a three-way partnership with Click Sergeant and, T and the Teenage Cancer Trust, charting away for the three organisations to collaborate really deeply. So he, he's all over partnerships, Frank. He, he's also 50 tomorrow. So happy birthday for tomorrow, Frank. Um, Thank and you, Jeff. to you to introduce the rest of the topic and, and the rest of the panel. 
Thank you very much. And um, can I just say, um, thanks so much for inviting me to do this, Geoff. Really excited. And um, it's great to be working with sustainability. Um, that ad we've just seen is a young person who sells with a sustainability group and also sells with the Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust, which is just a great example of working together. So um, loved the first keynote speech this morning. Absolutely fantastic. And I'm really hoping that this panel um, can really build on some of the themes that have been talked about already this morning and, and what this um, conference is all about. So um, we're joined. I'm going to let the, the four panel members introduce themselves. But we're joined by Liddy, Steve, Richard and Helen. Um, and hopefully um, over the next half an hour, we can really, you know, build on those questions that we've all got about how we how we get back, how we rebuild, how we restart. So, um, Liddy, can I can I pass over to you to just introduce yourself first and then we'll go to Steve, Richard and Helen, if that's OK. So over to you, Liddy, for a quick introduction. Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. Really good to be here today. Um, so my name's Liddy. I work for Disability Rights UK as project manager for our Get Yourself Active programme. Um, so Get Yourself Active is a programme that's funded by Sport England, and we aim to reduce the barriers that disabled people face when accessing physical activity. We work alongside disabled people and disabled people's user-led organisations to lead change in the social care, health and sports sectors. Um, and this is all to kind of support people to get active in a way that's right for them and to improve health and well-being outcomes. So there's a number of different projects that we're working on as part of the programme. For example, just to name a few, um, influencing social care and health professionals to have conversations about physical activity, influencing social workers so that they're able to gain the knowledge and skills to prescribe physical activity to, to disabled people. And we're also working to influence the sports sector so that they're able to work with disabled people to co-produce solutions to inactivity. And this includes the rolling out of co-production workshops. Um, as well as this, um, there's some other bits of work we're involved in. For example, we did a recent research project to find out how disabled people have been staying active during the pandemic. Um, and we've led on creating resources to support disabled people to be active at home. And we're also working with Sport England to de deliver TIF funding to various organisations who deliver physical activities to disabled people and have been hit by the pandemic. Um, so this funding is to help them to kind of continue to deliver these activities. Thanks, Lydia. That's great. So, Steve, over to you for a quick intro. Morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Steve McFaddy and I work for Alzheimer's Society. So I'm the Senior Officer for Physical Activity. Um, so for those that don't know, Alzheimer's Society is a, a national health charity. Um, so we're the leading leading dementia charity that provides information, support, advice. Um, we kind of look at how we can improve care for people affected by dementia. Uh, we fund research and ultimately we try and create lasting change for people affected by dementia. Uh, so that is Alzheimer's disease, but all other types of dementia as well. Um, with my work specifically, so my focus over the next two years is to really look at how we can build and learn from the evidence that's out there, find new insight by working with people affected by dementia, um, to look at and build the foundations for how we can in the future um, provide kind of more opportunities for them to be more physically active, give them ideas and creative solutions for finding ways that they can build physical activity into their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and similar to what Liddy was saying, looking at the barriers and looking at testing solutions on how, how we can do that so that they can be more active and enjoy a better quality of life with their dementia diagnosis. Steve, Richard, over to you. Morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name's Richard. I'm... Um, lead of adventurous activities at a independent specialist residential school in in lincolnshire so i work with people with severe learning difficulties autism and severe communication difficulties so my back my background's in developing communication and um, i'm a marketing tutor and a ding instructor a power bar instructor and um, we Sail with Lincoln District Sailing Association in in Highcombe, who affiliate Highcombe Highcombe Sailing Club. Um, I'm here really today, sort of, to add a school uh, perspective. But obviously, as a residential um, school, you know, it's, I see it's slightly different maybe to a mainstream school. But we've certainly got an appetite to to re-engage with our extended curriculum. Thanks. That's great, Richard. So Helen, last bit, but by no means least. A quick introduction 
morning everyone thank you for inviting me along um i'm helen mason and i run freewheeling inclusive dance we're based here in birmingham um and so what do we do we run dance classes for people with disabilities adults and children um and a lot of the people that come are wheelchair users um not that um other people can't come that's just kind of the way it is we focus a lot of on wheelchair dancing um and currently obviously since march 2020 we've moved online so we're doing all our classes right now online and we're offering four classes a week um and yeah and i'm just here to kind of represent my group because they've started doing uh, sailability classes with you <laughs> and that and that's great to hear that really is so um thank you for those instructions and i, and I think as joff said this will be a really useful session to to hear from different perspectives about um you know the, the how we go into a post-covid world so I, I suppose that leads on nicely to question one which um which is you know how have your beneficiaries been affected through covid and what barriers do you face um, getting back on the water? And we'll we'll try and make this more of a conversation. But perhaps I can come to you first, Steve, and maybe you can just cover off, you know, how people have been, how your beneficiaries have been effective, and what barriers you're going to face getting back on the water. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I'd just like to say I wish I wish I brought Helen's energy into my first introduction. That would have been much better. Um, <laughs> so something to something to learn from Helen there. Um, I think for yeah for our group, so we we support people affected by dementia. So by that we mean people living with dementia and also carers. Um, and it has been a really tough it has been a really tough year for people. There, there's the general things that I think will affect a lot of different groups. So in terms of a loss of stimulation, that lack of social contact that people have been missing, uh, a lack of engagement due to kind of lockdown measures, but also services, activities, groups, and things like that stopping. Um, and often we found that those those groups and those those activities that people love doing have been a lifeline for people when living with with dementia and, and other conditions. Um, but some of the more specifics, I think that people have, have had challenges with over the last year. So we've been doing a lot of research and insight with people living with dementia. Um, Right at the start of lockdown, people were really worried about losing kind of basic abilities like speech uh, and things. And they were starting to notice that because they weren't interacting as much with people as they previously were, um, they were kind of losing these functions that were quite daily functions that they would they would they would usually be fine with um and that obviously led to a massive drop in confidence and motivation for people which um which is yeah which is it's effect i think confidence and motivation have been a massive thing right across the board um for people um i guess people worried about the future they're they kind of worried that at, will they be able to get back to where they were um, before the lockdown measures were in place? If they were able to kind of use public transport independently, will they still be able to do that? Um, so there's a lot of worries and kind of heightened anxieties, I guess, around around what would, what does the future look like for them? And also people have kind of mentioned to us, like, will they get left behind when everything goes back to normal and things start going back to um back to activities and back to sessions will they be left behind and not kind of included and involved in those kind of restart of activities um so yeah they're just a couple of things i think from us that, that we've kind of noticed over the last year but I, i'm sure it'll be i'm sure some of the conversations will be be very similar for other other conditions that people support as well great thanks steve that's a really good oversight i don't know about which which panel member would like to go next and add to that i'll have to pick someone if not i, Ellen, I do don't mind oh. go on lily thank you <laughs> Sorry, That's got in there first. <laughs> it's harder. It's harder uh, uh, on a on a screen than sitting yeah, in a group of people. Yeah, it's not so. quite as not quite as natural, yeah, but, is it? <laughs> absolutely. But go um, go on, Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to to build on what Steve said, really about kind of the people being scared. Um, kind of coronavirus has has caused that's kind of heightened that anxiety that people are feeling, um, and we already know that disabled people face a lot of barriers when it comes to accessing physical activity um, and we're finding now that kind of one of those main barriers is is coronavirus and the resulting fear that that causes people um, so I mentioned briefly in my introduction we were part of a research project looking at how disabled people have been staying active during the, the pandemic um, and kind of finding out their experiences and that was something that came out of our research as well is, is people were scared um, and also we spoke to people when restrictions were starting to ease last summer um, but we found that people 
we're still really worried about going out and exercising in groups again, um, even as you know restrictions were starting to ease. Um, and I think this this is something that's going to kind of continue for a while. Um, I think you know even when things start to get better, there's still going to be that that fear from people, and there's still going to be people kind of wanting to stay active at home, maybe for a little bit longer. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something we've found as well. That's really useful. Helen, how have you found it with your group? I mean, you, we, we talked briefly before this session and, you know, you actually came to sailing almost because of COVID. So, yeah, um, which is, you know, so, but, but where is, where are your, where's your group now? And Well, so I think um, that obviously the main barrier for us is the majority of the group have been in the shielding category um, and a lot of them in the highly vulnerable category. So, I don't think it's too dramatic to actually say a lot of them haven't really like gone out for a year, like maybe out for a little whiz around the block. But a lot of them, you know, they're they're not getting out. They can't they can't go out. They don't want to go out for fear, you know, of becoming unwell. Um, so I think the main issue has been like the social isolation, you know, because we'd meet each other sometimes twice a week. You know, we'd have a good chat and there's there's all that isn't the surrounding sport. It's not just doing the physical activity itself. It's the meeting up with people, having a chat before, maybe grabbing a cup of tea afterwards. It's all that kind of stuff. Um, so that has been the biggest concern for me and the group is just everyone's mental health and not getting to see one another and being completely isolated. Um, so, yeah, the reason saleability kind of came up for us was to sort of solve that problem because we're obviously online, which is great and we're getting to see each other and keep active as much as we can in our small bedrooms you know um but it's not the same as being together so when we were offered um the sailability sessions in Birmingham once lockdown had kind of eased over the summer we jumped at the chance because we were like yes we want to get out there and see one another and it provided that safe safety as well because we're not because everyone's in separate boats we're in small groups um we're not close together which would have been a problem if we'd we couldn't have gone back to the hall and gone and done dance because we were too close together the hall's too small but being out boating you've got all that space you know um and actually that kind of resolved some of our issues and now we're back on lockdown again we're going back around the loop again of being like please let us back on the water <laughs> basically uh, absolutely and and, and Richard, just before I come to you, maybe I could just add to that. We've had a lot of the young people that we work with at the Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust who've been shielding, and and you know, I, 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 that that whole how people come out of this having shielded for you know some people most of the year is yeah, is really really tough, and I, and I think we yeah, I, I, we we are all all organisations, whatever we do, whoever we are, that work with people who have been shielding we have a huge amount of work to do in the future and, and we need to be gearing ourselves up for that work now because it, it really is going to be, there is there is a, a second crisis is going to be a different crisis, but we need to be there for it. Sorry, Richard, I, um, I, I butted in there. And it, I was about to come to you, so apologies. Yeah, no problem. No, I mean, it's similar themes, really. Um, I mean, as a residential school, we've obviously got lots, a lot of staff teams uh, as educational staff teams but also um support staff teams going in and out of the school so our primary concern has obviously been to minimize and um, the spread of an, an outbreak and if, for the health of the, the people we support really so we have the the young people really have been on site um yeah met probably for, probably for the best part of a year um like helen said and you know that creates you know a lot of challenges because we we do really miss meaningful activity and then you know our community presence is, is really really important um you know and boating brings you know that physical activity that social interaction um but also you know a lot helps to meet people's sensory needs and um you know, like you say it's really really important um i know that, that, that's caused um I suppose frustration for a lot of young people and you know sort of diminished sort of quality of life and you know confidence and you know their, their sort of world's been quite quite restricted and thinking about it from the sailability center's point of view obviously a lot of volunteers are shielding as well as um obviously our senior instructor and um, bosun was initially furloughed and it has been quite quite a challenge to 
to think about re-engaging. Um, yeah. Thank, thanks all. Um, and I suppose just before we move on to the next question, is there anything any of you want to add, having heard the other panel members share their experiences? I think it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, a story we're hearing lots. Um, so when Joff asked me to do this, I was I was slightly surprised, and then um, and obviously said yes straight away because one of the things that I've always been impressed with around sailability groups is that they are <clears throat> so good at removing barriers. You know, that's what sailability do so well, and that's you know all of the sailability groups do so well. So <clears throat> I suppose the second question is around, you know, how can sailability groups reduce and remove the barriers? that COVID has presented. And then, you know, a little bit like Helen, listening to you talk about the fact that you, you've come to sailing because of COVID, um, you know, what opportunities does a post COVID world present? So um, I, uh, I think that, that that would be the two questions and, and maybe I can go to you, um, go to um, who'd like to go first on this one. Um, Maybe I could. That's great, Liddy. Thank you. So, so yeah. So, Liddy, how can sustainability groups reduce and remove the barriers COVID has presented, and what opportunities does a post-COVID world present? Um, I think, firstly, because um, it's sometimes easy to focus on the negatives that the pandemic's brought about, um, but also kind of it's important to think about the fact that there have been quite a lot of positives around uh, that have come about. So, for example it's highlighted where we can kind of work quickly to create more inclusive conditions for everyone. Um, there's been a lot of kind of organizations collaborating, sharing resources with each other and working to kind of create more opportunities for disabled people. So I think if we can continue to build on that, um, kind of when the pandemic's come to an end, that will be really positive for people. Um, and I think the question you said around kind of reducing the, the barriers that COVID's brought about, the most important thing is having those conversations with disabled people. So now is that really great time to be able to engage with people and really co-produce with disabled people. Um, because you're never really going to truly know what people want until you start having those conversations and work together with the, you know, the people you're working with. And so it could be really simple things you can put in place to, re to reduce those barriers, for example, um, providing extra safe sessions to re-engage with people, um, but kind of involving disabled people in those decisions um, and kind of involving them in the design and delivery as we kind of go back to normal, we'll really make sure we come out of every, you know, the crisis stronger um, and means we can really kind of work together in partnership. Um, so yeah, that, I'd say that's really important is working really closely with disabled people now so that when things go back to normal, um, you know, you're really creating those more inclusive environments, really going off what disabled people have told you that they want as, as activities start to, to return to normal. I think that's so important, Liddy, and, and I claim no credit for it. It was entirely the team at the, the trust but at the beginning of covid this time last year we moved online and one of the things i was most impressed with the team was is that they went out to the young people that we worked with and said what do you want us to deliver now we can't deliver what we normally do and as i say i claim i claim no credit um it was the team that did that but we you know we we that was such an important stage in the process of responding to covid and i think it's such an important stage as we now respond to the to hopefully the post COVID or the post pandemic world. Um, who'd like to add to that? Uh, who, who, who go? Go on, Helen, and then uh, and then we'll come to Steve. Yeah, I was going to totally agree actually with what Liddy said, and and that just to ask, like sometimes it's something so simple and you forget. But if you just ask the people you are working with and just say, you know, what would work for you, what wouldn't work. Um, and just to say, Phil, our instructor, hey to Phil, um, <laughs> at the Midland Sailing Club that's been working with our group, he was so great at kind of checking in with their anxieties about what they did and didn't want to do. And for some sessions, he'd just say, look, if you just want to come and just watch, um, you know, if you don't feel ready to go out on the water yet, if you just want to come and observe and see what we do, that's absolutely fine. And he'd take away all that kind of stress and worry and, um, 
anxiety about maybe doing something if they weren't quite ready and the whole group were just like oh that that makes me feel so much better um that there's no kind of expectation but also checking in with those kind of anxieties that we're going to have for a while aren't we about covid and and whether people do feel ready or not ready um and you'll find that different people react differently you know i've got members of my group that are like ready to go right now <laughs> let's go and then others that are like oh let's hang on a bit let's wait and see um and it, it's checking in with that as well and also obviously with different people now getting the vaccine i think that creates for some people a new confidence or maybe a bit of reassurance um and again that's going to be completely different for each individual so I'd, I'd agree with what you were saying and just ask ask the individuals yeah, and, and I'm sure Richard and Steve will add to this, but I think that thing about some people feeling really, um, you know, some people feeling really ready to, um, you know, to get back and some people feeling really anxious is something we've seen. And and I think the vaccines as well, we're now seeing a, a number of young people who are extremely clinically vulnerable get their vaccines. So, you know, the, the vaccine rollout is coming. Sorry, Steve, over to you. Um, I know no, you had your hand up as well. Very, very similar comments. I guess just building, just building on it, that meaningful com consultation is is kind of vital, really, um, and kind of understanding. And, and Helen mentioned the word reassurance as well. That that is a massive thing for a lot of people. And understanding that if the, you have had groups come into your sessions previously, that actually their circumstances, their needs, their abilities might have might have changed quite a lot over the last year. And having that patience to support people. Um, and yeah, like the social side of these groups is arguably more important than the activity for a lot of people and whether that's getting them out on the water or just being in the environment, enjoying being in a different environment. Um, I think there is a big opportunity with, um, like I said, there will be the people at different stages and willing to some willing to come and, and others maybe not quite ready yet. Uh, but for the ones that are, it's a huge opportunity to to kind of bring back that misconnection that people have missed out on over the last year and you guys have a brilliant I was lucky enough to go to a sailability session um dragged onto the water but I thoroughly enjoyed it um and I think people generally that kind of thing that they are looking for can be offered by the sailability group so um yeah I think it would be to keep doing what you're doing and keep asking people what they want and and going with the flow with that with them thanks Steve Rich over to you yeah, again, I sort of concur with everything that everyone says about, you know, involving everyone, getting this holistic view of, of what moving forward might look like. Um, just trying a different perspective, really. I suppose myself I oversees a, a programme of activity in, in terms of being really proactive with, with, with the risk assessment and, and being prepared. Because obviously we don't know, you know the timescales and obviously we expect another announcement from and Boris sort of, I think it's the second of February so, um, but you know, COVID is a huge risk, and obviously it gives a lot, a lot of concern. But it, as as you said, um, we are we are great at overcoming barriers and you know mitigating risk. And you know, if we if we can do a risk assessment and just sort of highlight what what are those risks that that COVID brings to the table, and then look at you know practical solutions. Um, and just how we do things differently, you know, in terms of, you know, how we maybe disinfect things or how we quarantine boats or how what do we do with different boats or, you know, do we do you know, different you know, bubbles or do we train staff differently or do we use different transport? And you should be really creative in our thinking. I think, you know, we, we can be ready to go and then hopefully that will offer a, le a level of reassurance to people that they can actually see that they, these risks are sort of mitigated to you know a level we we can be comfortable with um because we, as a sailability group and like you said this is our you know bread and butter really isn't it in terms of you know risk about man handling and risk around capsize and risks around you know, you know all sorts of things and how we manage those is to sit back and be creative and you know come up with a solution and um you know i am i am enthusiastic that you know with a bit of creative thinking here that that we, we can get straight back on the water and we're probably ready um from a school perspective i think we might be a little bit ahead of the curve we are being laterally flow tested and we have had the vaccine and we are a bubble you know we, we have got established bubbles and you know perhaps we are because we have got trained staff we may be a little bit you know ahead um but yeah i just think it's about you know the, the planning stage as well really isn't it Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
And I, I think that the, um, you know, that saleability are good at overcoming. Joff, I'm, I'm hoping you're there. I'm not sure that we have time for any questions as we've got four minutes left. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Well, I was just going to pick up on Richard for saying there because we, we've had lots of questions both before and, and actually also during the conference, around, particularly around schools, because lots of saleability groups work with schools and um, that that you know how much Richard, how much do you think schools are going to prioritise um, uh, kind of classroom activities, or are they actually looking to get back involved in outdoor activity? Um, and, and what are the b biggest barriers they face? I know you said you're a residential school, so you might have a slightly different perspective. But what's your sense of kind of schools for people with disabilities and, and what they're looking to do? I think generally um, in, in outdoor education as a whole, obviously just gauging what's on Facebook and talking to the schools and other colleagues and other schools, th there is an appetite to to re-engage. Obviously, there, the, the extended curriculum is really important to schools. Um, and I know there's a lot of residential activity centres are really concerned that they've been hit quite a lot in the last year. And maybe overnight stays won't won't look the same, but people are looking for, for activities in the day. And I, and I think that as soon as people do consider things to be safe, I, I think there'll be a surge. of cause this will, Outdoor activity will be one of the first things to come back onto the table, won't it, in, in terms of... Um, you know, before you know, you know pubs and um, a lot of hospitality and I, I, no, I, I am I am encouraged and you know, there's a lot of people out there are, are being flexible one of my main accreditation streams the Duke of Edinburgh is and in, in using sailing as a mode of travel and of course the Duke of Edinburgh is really flexible in terms of what what those expeditions look like I think everybody is starting to adapt and yeah I think if food partnership working I think um, I think yeah, I do think there's an appetite to, to to get back out there Brilliant, thank you. And, and and you know, I think lots of the comments and lots of the questions are picking up on this, you know, the need to rebuild confidence and to rebuild motivation. And 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 actually, as as you've all recognised, people, um, lots of people have been very anxious about the virus, might not have left home too much. And you know, perhaps directly a question for you, Frank. Your organisation uh, works with people who are recovering from cancer. So, what are you doing to kind of rebuild? their confidence in time for when you can go back out on the water again so i i think that and, and if there was one takeaway for people to take away from this session for me it would be as a lot of the panel members have, have said talk to the people that you work with and I, and I think the answer to overcoming those concerns and and you know for a lot of our young people quite you know under you know completely understandable concerns and for lots of the groups that sailability work with, completely understandable concerns. But I think the big thing is talk to the to the to the people that you work with and talk to them and reassure them and find out from them what is going to make them feel happy to come back. And and, and I think also people are individuals. You know, we are going to have young people who desperately want to come back and have had the vaccine, and we're going to have young people who are at the bottom of the ladder for the vaccine and may, you know, may not even get the vaccine and may be very nervous and everything in between. I think it's all about talking to the to the groups, to the people, to the individuals that you work with and asking them what the barriers are. Um, and I'll come back next year, Geoff, and let you know how it went <laughs> and, and whether that worked. <laughs> Brilliant. Guys, that was that, that was a fantastic conversation, and, and I agree that you know that's absolutely my takeaway. Just ask, you know, what what's going to work for you, and and check in with people's anxieties. Don't pretend they don't exist because they they absolutely do exist. So check in with them, ask, and and find out what would work with you. That's brilliant, and it's almost as if you directly link to our next session. So we've got the next session has got a whole load of sailors talking about their experiences, their concerns what 2020 was like and what also they're hoping for 2021. So just tuning into exactly what people want. But that, that guys, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Frank, Liddy, Helen, Richard and Steve. That was that was really good. Thank you for your time. Uh, Helen, I love the fact that you you, you you found sailing because it was better and easier this year than, than being in a hall. So I just think that's a great story. Um, guys, we've got another break now. Time to make another cup of tea. Frank, I think you deserve a 50th size glass of champagne. Have a great day tomorrow. Um, and uh, we'll see you all soon somewhere along the way. Um, so we Thank are starting again. Cheers, guys. So we're starting again at eleven thirty, everyone. Um, and we, we know we know that sailability didn't happen a lot. We, 
didn't ha did happen last year, even in limited ways. We know that one of the factors that made it happen was sailors being able to voice how important activity was to them, and what they needed to make sure it was, you know, how to stay safe. So the panel, the next panel are going to explore why boating is so important, the barriers they face now and the hopes and fears for the season ahead. So we'll see you all at 11.30. Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed your cup of tea. It certainly feels slightly strange um, not being aware of that buzz of conversation you normally get in a tea break at a conference and just hearing how everybody's engaging. But it's great to see all of the comments come through on YouTube and Facebook, um, which is almost as good. So as promised, the next panel is all about sailors and their experience of 2020, as well as their thoughts about getting back on the water this year. Um, I'm really grateful to David Durston for chairing this discussion and to Ben, Kate, Anna and Kath for taking part. Do keep posting questions in the comments section and uh, over to you, David, and the panel. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, this is a panel to talk to to people with, um, yeah, with disabilities about how how the year's affected you really with the, the whole COVID epidemic and um, how it's affected your sailing and um, and life generally over over the year and what, what you're looking forward to in the um, in the year to come when hopefully um, things are a little bit better than they have been. Um, can I start by just getting you to do a brief introduction um, just to say who you are, um, where you sail and what you sail? Uh, I'll start with Cathy. Hi, um, my name's Cathy. Um, I'm from the Midlands and at the moment I'm just getting back in uh, to sailing. And what were you doing when you had a gap from sailing? Not a lot. Um, I do, <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. I actually do um, competitive wheelchair dancing. Interesting. So, yeah, so there's a lot of there was a lot of training involved with uh, wheelchair dancing and uh, teaching and I taught cadets as well, sea cadets. Oh, I'd like to know about more about the dancing. OK, um, Ben, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, I'm Ben and I'm autistic. I um, uh, sail at Oxford Sailability most of the time and also a bit at Dorchester Sailing Club in Oxfordshire, um, not the city of Dorchester. Um, and um, uh, generally I sail a Hansa 2.3 um, at Sailability and I also sail um, a variety of boats at um, the mainstream sailing club such as a uh, Laser 4.7 and uh, Topper. Thank you. Um, Hannah, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Hannah. I sail at Bolton Sailability Group. I sail a Hansa 303 double handed um, and I've been sailing for well forever now um, I love sailing especially competitive sailing and my ambition would be to sail a variety of different boats fast boats preferably and I would like to experience um, offshore sea sailing especially um within tall ships okay great thank you and kate i'm kate and i'm a member of blind sailing uk um so i have to travel distance sometimes to uh to go to training when we can um and i love sailing that much that i'm willing to try any sort of size of a boat anything from a dinghy right up to the tall ships and um it's just an amazing hobby to have. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go around each of you and find out um, a little bit about what um, what sailing means to you. What do you what, what do you get from sailing? Um, so I'll, I'll go in a different order. Can I, can I start with you, Ben? What um, what what does sailing give you? Well, I think it's great fun it's really fun and when the wind is at the right speed it can be very exciting the main thing that sailing does for me is that well as, as my autism i have very high anxiety and 
sailing is what relieves my stress and it, it gives me a focus and I can almost just escape from the rest of the world and forget about my worries I'm having uh, at that point uh, for a few hours. Thank you. Um, what about you, Hannah? What, what do you get from, from sailing? Uh, well, sailing means to me everything. Um, before I started sailing, I was very depressed. Um, so um, I didn't have any friends, really. Um, I didn't have any social life, any interest of my own. So it's given me all of those things. Um, because I'm um, very uh, poorly sighted, um, the sailing has given me a huge sensory experiences. Um, I enjoy the movement of the boat, the wind, um, the physicality of having to um, move the boat and have built strength and uh, coordination's improved and uh, my sitting posture has improved. It, it's helped me in so many ways. I'm so grateful. That's brilliant. Oh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, where should we go now? Katie. Kate. Um, to me, I would say sailing to me uh, is just a, such an enjoyable thing to do, whether it be at sea or on the water. It's a chance for me to hit that pause button and to sort of not forget that I ha I am visually impaired. But I would say it's a break from how society perceives you and it allows me to just feel the freedom especially when i'm trying to helm um helm a boat i, I obviously i'm not allowed to drive a car so it's it's a me it's the equivalent um and just the thread of excitement and the independence it gives you is just i can't actually put it into words it's great and how does it feel you know being being blind in in a boat you have to put a lot of trust in in other people yeah you, you do actually um and it trust is a very hard thing to you know to want to give to somebody in that sense but because when i say all oh, i'm mostly with blind set in uk's volunteers that you know they're all amazing at what they do they all give up their time um and you do just build up a bond with them and even if you haven't met them before you know you come back from being out on the water for say i don't know an hour two hours and it's like you've just got that unbreakable bond really, yeah. and you do trust them even yeah. if it does suddenly go a bit hairy and and you almost capsize the boat perfect and, and that's, i'm sorry go ahead Anna. I was going to say, I think as much as trusting other people, you learn to trust yourself. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And and Kathy, what do you what do you get out of sailing? Um, yeah, from sailing, for me, it's um, freedom, freedom of movement. Um, I'm actually more freer moving, or I feel more more free moving when I'm in a boat rather than in my chair. Um, I feel that um, having that wind element, um, you never can control wind, and I'm a real uh, thrill seeker. <laughs> so being a thrill seeker, it means that um, I like the unpredictability of sailing um, because I get a real big buzz out of that. Um, always was a thrill seeker before my accident and before my disability got the better of me. Um, and it means that I can push my boundaries. I like pushing myself. I don't like to sit back and sort of um, think of myself as the poor disabled person. Um, I like to keep up with the rest of the world. Um, and when I'm in a boat, um, if people don't really know their boats, they don't really recognize the disability at all um, because they're just seeing somebody sat down in a boat. So they don't see the wheels and they see me, just yeah. me. But I really, really, really do um, just come to life when I'm sailing. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a different person when I sail, a happier person. Um, and I just can't wait for the next session of sailing to happen. 
Mm. So it, it's it's amazing. Um, I you know I hope I can sail you know for as many many more years as I can you know. Yeah, yeah, I know where you're all coming from. I'm I, I've had to shield for the last year, and sailing has been such yeah. a big part of my life. For, uh, yeah, oxygen. Well, so yeah, I know the, the feeling. Last Fifteen years, and um, yeah, I really look forward to getting out there and racing. And I love the love the competition and the, the experience. Yeah. And uh, I forget about all the pain and anything anything else from the outside world. So yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from. So how how was last year for everybody else? How was 2020 with the pandemic? How did it affect your your sailing activity? Uh, I'll start with Hannah. Uh, well, Bolton, we our sailors are um, the majority are in the extremely vulnerable category, and we also have all our volunteers are are, are older, so. Um, it, it affected our sailing greatly in that we couldn't really um, participate. Um, simply, the, the risk was just too big. Um, so we haven't really um, you know, sailed. We've really missed it. We do have a WhatsApp group that we keep in touch um, and try and communicate and share things uh, as much as we can, but we have really missed the sailing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what about you, uh, Kate? Um, I was actually very fortunate enough to be able to attend some um, limited training sessions on the water last year with blind sailing. And um, because we did go online for a lot of our learning, it enabled me to back up what I'd actually picked up. And um, it enabled me, I suppose it kind of helped me to really enjoy what I'd learned and and feel the enthusiasm for sailing again and I and actually last year I didn't realize until last year that um I use sailing as therapy like you you read a lot in books and you know people say oh yeah it's therapy and you I honestly I was quite skeptic and now I'm I completely agree it is it's just amazing to have the opportunity to go sailing whenever you can really yeah Absolutely. What about you, Kathy? How, how's your year been? Um, it was it was a good year and a sad year, really. Um, I only started restarted sailing last year in um October time, September October towards the end of the year. Um, once again, we're in very small amount of numbers because we have to be um shielding i should shield um and it was a case of drive straight to the reservoir get out of my vehicle straight on a boat don't make contact with anybody um and you know although some people yeah i shouldn't have gone i did go um it was a case of i just couldn't pass up the opportunity but then after uh, you know sort of two or three sessions we've had to shut down and although I've sailed before, getting that enthusiasm back at those first couple of sessions mm -hmm. and it really almost hitting me in the chest again with this, wow, you can do this still. Um, the downside of, oh, my goodness, I've got to stop it again. Yeah. Um, it really, really hit me hard um, because I was suddenly discovering this new world again for me yeah. um very much like kate um we've now started online learning um we've we've got um homework as to say <laughs> sent back to us to learn but for you know so i'm refreshing bits that i you know know and making sure that i have got it right in my head but it's still not the same as getting back on water and really feeling that vibe i'm really missing it if I can add um, one thing I will I am so grateful for is the community behind the club that I'm fortunate enough to be a member of um, yeah. we had the training sessions but we also had fun kind of funny games evenings as well and I admittedly um, I think at the end of it I ended up seeing them more 
than I ever used to because we only ever used to really meet once a month in you know physically in it to do training and then I, I think at one point I was meeting at least one or two members if not more four times a week because we'd started to do begin to sail courses for complete beginners obviously you can't get them on the water but you give them the basics uh, yeah. over zoom and it was so, so fun and it was it gave me something to focus on so I, for that I'm eternally thankful yeah, we've been doing lots of um, virtual regatta stuff with the um, the Hansa members, so that's been been quite fun. As you say, I've seen them probably more often than than I would uh, would otherwise have done. What about you, Ben? Has um, have you been finding it with your anxiety and? Well, twenty twenty uh, was going to be the year I was going to take my GCSEs. Um, and the other thing that was going to happen, well, the other thing that did happen. Um, was that I, I moved from a special school to a mainstream sixth form, which did happen. Um, but my, my plan was that during the um, exam period, I would be sailing at the weekends as a bit of a de-stress of taking my mind off them almost. That doesn't matter as much because it didn't happen. The thing is with that is that um, sailing, as I said before, is my stress reliever. and we all we all know that lockdown is a very stressful time and I didn't have that stress reliever because we couldn't sail and that was very difficult for me because I couldn't access the thing that relieved my stress. After lockdown um, for a few reasons Oxford sailability wasn't able to get back on the water um, however what, what we were able to do is that I was able to do more sailing with um, Dorchester Sailing Club um, who are very helpful, very understanding of my needs and very good at helping me um, access uh, mainstream sailing through, um, um, even though I've got needs which are um, make it more difficult. And they um, they were able to help me get back sailing there and um, I had fun. They were able to help me get to sail faster boats um, uh, a few times, including the Laser 4.7 a few times, which is something I wasn't expecting, very exciting. The, I made a realisation um, over the summer as I was doing more racing and race training um, that the mainstream, that my, well, my ability to race in the mainstream sailing, sailing setting is very limited because the environment and the aggressive competitiveness of such events is just not accessible and it's just too difficult for me to cope. Um, while I am more confident that even though I've done less racing with um, sailability, that it's much easier to access um, from previous experience. And that will be much better um, for me in the long term. Uh, and if I just sailed, if I raced in mainstream setting, it would take away the fun a bit, which would make it a bit worse for me. Okay. Can I stay with you then? Ben, just to find out what what are your aspirations for 2021 and uh, as much as we obviously it's very uncertain at the moment as to what 2021 is going to look like for, for most people but what would you like it to look like and um, are you, have you got any concerns about what it might look like? The, the thing is is that last year I got my hopes up um, about it and actually it came sort of crashing down a bit when I heard that sailability wasn't coming back so I, this year I don't want to get my hopes up about sailing sustainability. Uh, so I'm in the most disappointment if it doesn't happen and hopefully it'll be a lot more happy if it does. Um, I'm relatively confident that I will be able to sell in some form. And I mean, possibly a sustainability, uh, but I'm unsure about that because it's very uncertain right now. Um, if we are able to turn, I still have the last year's plans and hopes that I made after last year's sailability wars, where I won the Sailability Sailor of the Year award. The main hopes for me are to sail faster boats than the Hansa 2.3, um, particularly the two ones which I've been hoping to sail uh, for almost a year now are the Challenger and the 2.4 metre. Um, and then the, the last thing that I'd like to hope to do would be to go on a Island Trust residential trip, uh, which is a, on a tall ship and that, that was postponed last year. The things Island Trust, um, they do tall ship trips out of um, Plymouth mm -hmm. and it was 
one of these trips with my special school a few years ago that actually got me into sailing in the first place and I've never really looked back after that. <laughs> okay thank you that's a very pragmatic approach to it I think that's all we can what we can do at the moment isn't it with it's like we get what we get and so uh, hopefully it will be good. Um, Cathy what, what about you what, what are you hoping to do next year? Oh. This year? <laughs> Well, hope really, really hoping that they can stop doing shutdowns. Um, so basically, do as much sailing as I can if I if I round it right up to that. But splitting it down, um, I'd like to get to know um, the sailing club that I'm with, um, get to know everybody else, and see the uh, sailability section of that grow, so that we I get to meet more people, get more experiences and able to uh, exchange experiences um, with people um, so that um, my love of sailing can get back to, back to the level of, of what I used to have. Um, as I've said, I've, I've really found that the few sessions that I've got have given me this amazing thing of um, Oh my goodness! I got on the boat and you know I could tack straight up the other end of the you know the lake really easy, but getting into what boats I can properly sail, um, and finding which which level is going to be a good level for me to sail at. Um, my 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 needs have changed so much in the last few years um, that. You know, for me, 2021 will be the year that I can find out what type of boat is going to suit me mm -hmm. and uh, and actually get to know other people in the realms of sailability um, to also get that new friendship circle um, and, and exchanging of knowledge. Thanks, sir. And Kate, what plans have they got for um, blind sailing in, in 21? Is there a, a full um, programme? Who knows, to be honest, at the moment. It's not that we don't want to go sailing, obviously, because we all do. But um, I, I think that as soon as we've, we've given the green light, we can just go. Because we, where we did the training last year, we had to put changes in place. But it proves that actually it works. By, even though we did it only a few sessions, we, you know, adapt. We adapted and we actually had a lot more we spent it felt like we spent more time on the water actually um and we were able to really focus on one-to-one -one, um develop um you know individual um <laughs> development which was amazing and I, i'm really looking forward to kind of carrying on from from last year and also to um go and meet people at western sailing club because as i i said i wanted to join their last year and obviously it hasn't happened yet so i'm looking forward to trying to sail with a group that isn't specifically for people with disabilities and how about you hannah what what, what are you looking forward to this year um like i said i i, I we hope the restrictions and the shutdowns will uh be lifted but who knows but um i would like to do some competitive sailing if i could um i'd also like to expand on the sailing experiences and opportunities i'd like to sail different boats bigger boats faster boats tall ships i, I really i'm looking to the future to broaden my, my sailing experiences and opportunities and develop um, as a person in whatever way is possible um i'm open to anything really anything um i just want to get back on the water um as soon as it's safe to do so Something I've really missed has been the travel this year because we normally go to international competitions. Yeah. And, and in 2021, the World Championships are due to be taking place in, in Sicily, the Hansa World Championships in, in October. So I'm really hoping that I'm going to be able to go on a on a road trip and get over there and compete and also get some boats over there for other Hansa sailors to, to get over there and take part in it as well. So um, that's my big, yeah, big uh, aim I, and hope for the year. I really miss Rutland this year. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, because Rutland was kind of where all the competitive sailing kind of first begun. So it's all, it always was a special place in the art, really. Just in general, how would sort of, um, you know, what does sailing give to you? Just to turn the question back on you. I'm sailing, just yeah, to really, uh, I, it's given me a real sense of um, self-esteem and a sense of purpose as well, because, um, before my injury i was um quite high up in a in, in a company and um uh, i suppose um when, when i had max that really dents your confidence you don't get seen the same once you're in in, in a wheelchair you don't get treated the same and um mm -hmm. sailing has really enabled me to be included in the sailing community alongside able-bodied people in the main sailing club I can compete alongside them on, on level terms. You know, the, the, the boat is a great level. If you get a boat that works for you, then you can um, you can compete alongside everybody else. So uh, I, I just find it's given me that sense of sense of purpose, self-esteem and um, confidence again. And, and it's a great community. I really like being part of the sailing community and the people with like minded people um the trips that we go on as well the travel i, I get yeah just it, it's, it's become a yeah a huge part of my life and uh yeah i've really missed it really missed it this year well thank you all very much that's uh yeah, very very interesting to hear from you all and um, everyone's got slightly different different perspectives and different experiences but uh it's interesting to hear what you all get out of the the sport and uh, how, how this year has affected you and um yeah fingers crossed everything turns out better better this year we start to get uh, back to some sort of normality and uh, uh, uh and enjoy getting back to sailing again and seeing everybody so yeah thank you all That was a great discussion. Um, uh, thank you to David and all of the panel. Um, we, we did record that discussion about 10 days or so ago, and you have been putting questions to the panel, both in the lead up to the conference and, and also I can see in some of the comments. So um, I, I did manage to get one of those questions back to them and, and they've given me their answers. So Kirsty Lydiard from Ch Chesil Side Ability asked, what measures or procedures would, would you like to see as a sailor, would, would you like to see in place which would enable you to feel safe in resuming sailing again this year and, and some of the answers were just brilliant so ben um talked about his anxiety again and ben said he's aware that he's not um vulnerable or at risk from covid in the way that many people are he still worries about covid for lots of reasons particularly because he's involved in the care of his grandparents who, who are uh, at the highest risk group so so he said my response to your question um is is answered around the things that make me anxious much of which is about needing to know that other people are following the rules. So, so some of his thoughts were, um, I would like people to wear masks um, uh, and face coverings, um, unless they're exempt, of course. Uh, even though wearing masks outside isn't compulsory, that would still give Ben a level of reassurance. And he said, I'd like to know the boats are disinfected between users and, and between sailors so that the equipment is clean. He said, I'd like to see hand sanitizer on the pontoon with the sign asking people to use it and not rely on people bringing their own. Because then Ben, you know, I would know, as Ben said, I would know that people are using it because it's there and it's visible and there's a sign. Um, ben said, I worry about the space on the pontoons and distancing. Doesn't always have a solution to that, but that that's a, that's a concern, that space on the pontoon and distancing. Um, and he said, interestingly, he said, not really connected to the question, but I wondered if some groups are able, who are able to go sailing, there'd be some sort of system where they could invite, allow sailors from other groups who are not able to get back on the water yet to join. So everybody gets as many opportunities as possible. And, and as you could hear there, Kate um, talked about some of her experience with blind sailing last year. So actually they learned a lot from some of the procedures that worked. Um, they had one-to-one -one support bubbles, um, on the water so they kind of limited the number of people you had contact with um, and and you know so that was an important part of it um, and and David talked about the procedures um, 
what procedures will be in place to ensure social distancing by volunteers and all the other sailors. He, he wants to know that, he wants to know how numbers are being controlled, he wants to know how safety measures are being maintained on the water and not compromised in any way, uh, and, and information about what facilities can I use and, and how will their cleanliness be ensured. So it's not just the stuff that happens on the water, it's the stuff that happens on the shore as well. And how is it going to impact on the experience of going sailing, the, the social side? Will I be able to go racing? All those sorts of things again. So he wants to know all of that. And, and ultimately, I, I guess, David, like everyone else, has got that decision. Is the risk worth the reward? Um, so so that was a great question. I, I'd love to thank all of the panellists, um, Kathy, Katie, Hanny, Hannah and Ben, particularly Dave Durston for chairing it. Um, and thank you to... Stephen and Helen and Richard and Liddy, Frank, for the earlier discussion. And of course, to Rick um, for, for bringing Tanny to our world and lighting up our conference with such a great presentation. Um, we've had a huge amount of questions and comments leading up to and during the event and during, um, uh, you know, in the comments on Facebook as well. And the format perhaps makes it hard to respond to everyone, but we will do our best. We will work through what you said. We will come back to you. Please do contact us if you've got um, any more questions or you want any more information after the day. But, but you know, perhaps I can focus on a couple of the questions that I have seen coming through. Um, you know, it's certainly, I, I, I've seen questions about restarting. And of course, we've got a session um, uh, next Friday about restarting sailing. So do join Brett, um, Steve Mitchell, and, and, and a few others from the organization about looking at restarting in detail. But, I've seen questions about mixed household sailing and, and in a variety of different vessels. And I've seen uh, questions about using hoists. And, and, and I guess, you know, Tani started to give us the answer and, and then the organisations panel and, and the sailors began to, to build on that answer a little bit more. Yes, there are lots of mitigations we can put in place and we know that they've worked both through the sailability activity that happened last year and the wider sailing community. You know, and, and that's about face coverings. It's about mm -hmm. avoiding face to face contact. It's about limiting the number of contacts and limiting the duration of contact that people will have. But as we built on today, it is about talking it through. So you everybody, make sure everybody understands what those mitigations and controls are. Talk it through, come up with a plan and decide if all of the people involved and that's the sailors and the volunteers are happy with that plan. And if people are then it may be okay for that activity to happen. And if people aren't happy, you need to go back to the drawing board and do that plan again. So I think that there aren't any simple answers that are going to work for everybody, but I think that process is, is going to be really, really, really important and, and should see us back on water. And, and when I looked at you know lots of the comments you've been making today and lots of the comments that we saw as you booked for this conference, you know, it, it's really clear that people are um, thinking very hard about how do we stay COVID secure? How do we run activity in a way that is COVID secure? What will the guidance be? Can we keep up with all of the changes? How can we operate? Is social distancing going to be possible? Um, you know, the challenges that we've just talked about, about two or more people in, in uh, two or more handed boats and having multiple people in boats. Will our activity is going to be implicated in virus transmission? All of those are genuine, genuine concerns. Um, and, and lots of you are worried about the level of activity that's going to be possible next year. There is a fear that maybe we won't be able to operate or there won't be enough sailing or we'll start later on in the season. Um, we won't be allowed to meet. And then the social side of it is as important as much as everything. And, and yes, there's a huge amount of optimism about uh, the vaccination programme and, and the opportunities that's going to free up. Um, as Tani said, we're going to be living with this virus for a while yet, so we have to make sure all those other mitigations are in place as well. And, you know, increasingly, I think sailing clubs and sailability groups and, and clubs and centres are aware of the ever increasing pressure on funding and the ability to raise funding, particularly when activity is limited, both for clubs and centres, but also, also to the organisations who come sailing with us. How viable in the long term uh, uh, clubs and, and centres going to be so that those kind of long term issues are uh, we haven't seen the full effect economic effect of this pandemic yet and uh, so that that is definitely a concern and, and then as we've heard throughout today that kind of confidence and reassurance piece will sailors come back can we retain and motivate our volunteers what reassurance do people need that it's going to be safe to return will people lose interest will they lose their confidence will they lose their skills 
Um, you guys know all of these questions. You're asking all the right questions. It, it, it's now about time uh, to start talking to each other and coming up with some of the answers so we, we can restart and rebuild. Um, you know, and as, as Tani said, it, it, it's about asking. It, it's about it's about not being silly and, and you know making sure people are following the rules. It's about asking what the plan should be and, and, and providing reassurance and, and, and tuning into people's anxieties. So I guess you know that is the biggest question, isn't it? Whether to restart activity or not. Um, and unfortunately, it's one individual organisations are going to have to make themselves. We will do our best to offer you all the guidance and advice that we can. Um, as we've said a few times, organised outdoor sport and activity for disabled people is possible today under the current regulations. And we know one or two groups who have been exploring getting people on the water. And Sport England were really clear that one of the reasons they advocated with government for having that ability to do organised outdoor sport for disabled people in the current lockdown was because not allowing it would have had a disproportionate impact on disabled people. And it's definitely possible that outdoor sport and activity be will, we, will be one of the first things to open up post this lockdown. We'll, we wait and see. Um, and we've been surprised many times, but that's certainly possible. So, yes, I, I do think we should be absolutely determined to put our best efforts to restarting sailability activity. But you will decide when that's right for you and we'll do whatever we can to support. Um, you now, our priority this year is absolutely to recover the sport to restart and rebuild activity and opportunities for disabled people on the water. That means a number of projects and, and themes and activities for us. Um, so the More Than Sailing campaign has, has been ticking along for a couple of years. We've given lots of support to, um, we've, we've provided the templates for everyone to use the campaign. We've provided some in-depth support to about 20 groups now. But we, we recognise that there's more we need to do at the national level. So we're currently working with an agency to plan the More Than Sailing campaign this summer so we can be much more proactive about regular communication and regular awareness raising as part of the campaign. Um, so we're going to be doing much more to highlight the benefits and the opportunities for disabled people to get on the water. Absolutely, in the beginning of that, that will be about providing the reassurance we've talked about throughout this conference. Um, and, and as things uh, become clearer and easier, it will be about persuading new people back. We are looking for a communication professional at the moment to work one day a week with us on this campaign to deliver the campaign that the agency planned for us. That job is currently live on the RYA website. Do have a look if you're interested and you've got that communication experience and or you've got that lived experience of disability. And, and please do let your networks know. Tell everybody about that job. It's a really exciting opportunity. Um, so, so do have a look at that. Um, as you're probably aware, we've been monitoring the feasibility of this year's multi-class regatta. It was due in June, which is very close now. And we've still got no clarity yet on what would be possible for an event of that size and um, with such large numbers and with the complexity that comes with it. And as we've said a few times, our priority is on restarting activity locally, giving people the opportunity to get back on the water where they can. So we have decided to cancel the regatta. But we will be launching a national challenge to encourage people back on the water as wherever and as when that's possible. And we will be working with the class associations and some others to make sure there are some great competitive opportunities out there and, and for the community to come together in the way that that Monte class provides. So look out for that. And you know, the, by not having the multi class, we freed up some time and we freed up some budget. So we will be working with our partners, the local and national organisations who can help us reach disabled people who may want to go boating. Perhaps the start point is to build up a picture of how far our links go locally and, and how we can maximise those opportunities. So we'll definitely be investing in our partners. More than anything, we'll be investing in people because without volunteers, without staff, we won't be able to restart activity. So time will be spent helping you reassure when it's OK to return and making sure you and your volunteers and your sailor skills and knowledge are up to date. So, so that kind of investing in people piece will be really important. And we'll be focusing on safety because it underpins everything that we do. More resources, more learning, more sharing of practice. And we're going to explore the feasibility of a service that gives you an independent, critical friend look at your safety systems. So, so watch the space for that. Um, development sessions we're running over the next two weeks. We'll touch on lots of these themes and many more as well. If you signed up to them, you're going to get an email in the next day or so with your joining details. But we look forward to seeing you for an in-depth look at volunteering, at club development, at restarting activity, 
Um, some great sessions from, from Sense on complex communication. Um, we're looking at safety management systems over a couple of weeks. We're looking at running engaging sessions on the water and we're looking at improving your sailing. So do, do join us for those sessions. We're really looking forward to seeing you and having a, a slightly more in-depth conversation than has been possible today. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, like lots of organizations, the RYA has had a difficult year as well. Um, what, what was really encouraging in, in this lead up to this conference, two thirds of you told us that you're already members of the RYA and that makes you an exceptional audience. You're exactly the kinds of people who'd want to support the work of the RIA, and I hope you benefit from the work that we do. It, it has been a tough year, and it's been a tough year for, for RIA membership and RIA members. I'd like to think we've been there for each other, but it, and we would appreciate your help. More sailors and volunteers who join the RIA, the quicker we can grow back membership to those pre-COVID levels, making us stronger and ultimately better able to continue to help clubs and centres get more disabled people involved in voting. So, so to make sure you rejoin the RYA, do tell your friends about the benefits of being a member of the RYA and, and let's see if we can recover that membership as well. Um, there's a huge amount coming up in the next few months, um, all of it virtual at the moment. Um, on the 27th and 28th of February, we've already seen the video, but we have got the dinky show, some fantastic comment uh, content from some great sailors uh, from you know sailing every type of vessel so it's the usual engaging really interesting and, and and content that massively improves our knowledge so do come along to the dinghy show we've got instructor training days on the 13th of march um this will be a virtual day in the first place and then when uh face-to-face -face activity is possible again the, there might be some some regional events happening linked to that do sign up for the instructor training day on the 13th of march and, and actually, for the first time, the OIA is running a cruising, cruising conference on the 21st of March. So do sign up for that if, if, if you want to explore new types of voting for you. And finally, some thank yous from me. Um, a massive thank you to Baroness Tani Gray-Thompson for her brilliant keynote and for giving up her time on a Saturday morning. Um, and, and, and Rick, thank you so much for asking her in the first place. It was brilliant to be able to get her along and you were instrumental in that. Thank you to everybody who's been involved in the, the discussion panels. It was brilliant working with you um, and thinking about the questions and, and, and really insightful hearing your discussions. But particularly thank you to Frank Fletcher and Durston who chaired them so brilliantly. Um, thank you to Brett, Sarah, Leon, James and Jane who are, who are running the sessions in the next week or two, who've been responding to comments and keeping things going in the background today. Um, and to all of the presenters that they've roped in for the, for the sessions in the next couple of weeks massive support so thank you for that um thank you to sport england and gallagher at your ongoing support events like this wouldn't be possible so we, we really appreciate working with you um, thanks to voice box for providing the subtitles on our website um, it's been a really important way of making sure the content gets out to as many people as possible so thank you to them um thanks to tom and james from our from our digital and video team for producing the event for us They've been pressing all the buttons in the background and making sure we're live at the right times and microphones are switched on. Um, and so thank you for that. Most of all, a massive thank you to Melissa, um, who behind the scenes makes all this event happen. She organizes it. She sorts out all the logistics. She responds to everybody's emails. Uh, she, she's uh, been at doing it. So thank you, Melissa. And most of all, thank you to all of you for joining uh, in such great numbers. It's been brilliant to see you. It's been a shame we can't do it in person, but fantastic that we've been able to do it virtually. Thank you for being so engaged this morning and all your comments. We, we will do our best to get back to you all on most of it. Most of all, thank you for your support in making sailability happen and for all that you're going to do in 2021. 20, um, uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward to working with you all. So please do stay safe and we will all see you soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.